My name is Jimmy Liao. I'm an associate professor of biology here at the Whitney Lab for Marine Bioscience. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. Um, it is a very distinct pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Ok Otar Akinyeti. Otar uh, has a BA in electrical engineering. He's got a master's and a PhD in robotics. He did a postdoc, which is what you do after your PhD to get a little more experience, in informatics in Italy, I believe. And then he stumbled into my lab in 2012 to do a postdoc with me. I had to fix my light switch the other day. And I didn't know how to do it. Right? I'm fine to put a dimmer light in. And I Googled how to do it. And there's a YouTube video that came up, showed me how to do it. I could figure it out. What do you do when you can't Google something and you can't figure out something to do? Like, you don't know how it works. Well, I think um, one of the great things about the Whitney Lab is that we train scientists to figure out how to get new knowledge, not look up stuff, not get a good grade on something, not to fix somebody's arm, but how do you actually get new knowledge in the world? It's something that's not quite appreciated. Um, and so part of what we do at the Whitney Lab is to train scientists. I say this, uh, although Otar uh, came already pretty well trained, so it wasn't really a mentor relationship so much as a colleague type of relationship. And so he would speak kind of engineering to me and I would speak biology back to him, and somehow we were able to um, work together and come up with some uh, great science. Some of the best uh, work that I've done in my career has been with Otar Akinyeti. It might seem um, obvious, but in order to gain knowledge, you need to uh, want to know knowledge. So you have to be curious. And Otar is one of the most curious people I have ever met in my entire life. You couple that with a searing intellect and great things can happen. So Otar, I'd like to welcome you back to the Whitney Lab as a professor. He runs his own lab now uh, at uh, Aberystwyth University in Wales. He's got more students than I do now. I'm looking forward to how he's translating some of the fish swimming research that he did in my lab to even more broader and impactful things. Otar, you have the stage. Hello, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Oh. So first of all, it's true honor and humbling experience to be here in front of you today. Uh, when I came with me in 2012, I was an engineer. And thanks to Jimmy, I think I left as a scientist. And not just Jimmy, but also the culture at the Whitney, starting with Mark and trickling down all the way to uh, Scott, who takes care of this place. It, it, it was amazing, and when I came back, it felt, it felt like coming back home. And truly, truly, it's an honor to be here and just speak to you. So, uh, I, now I have my own lab, and... Yeah, of course. Oh, great. Thank you. And if you just want to summarize it, it the, the, the main point is I try to integrate approaches from different disciplines to study locomotion. So that's the big umbrella term that we are trying to cherish in my new and infant, infant lab. And but what I'm going to talk to you about today, and usually when you look at my background, you see a lot of uh, robotics, a lot of fish, but recently, for multiple reasons, I also started getting interested in human, human locomotion. And I'm taking a big risk today because I'm going to try to convey you some very interesting work and very interesting messages that I have been accumulating in the last year or so. So it's also a very new topic to me, and I'm no expert on this, but I would like to learn, I would like to just experience, I would like to take the risk, and let's see what the journey takes us today. For some reason, if you find the topic not interesting, we can easily switch to fish and then uh, <laughs> talk about that. So like I said, um, integration is very, very important, and not just 
for the sake of science, but I think for the sake of me, because I'm, I'm not expert in any of them, and I have to switch fields quite often so people don't figure that out. Because if I stay in a field for a long time, then, then my true colors come, come true. But before I start, I just want to say a few things about Whitney. And Whitney is a unique experience, and you, when you look at this photo, just you know where you are automatically, and that's, that's, that's because you experience Whitney. Whoever worked at Whitney Lab, I think this photo is now uh, foreign to them. And especially the uh, person who's playing the guitar is Jimmy and I, are a used student a few years back, Joy. And this was like after five, after long hours of experiments, just I was about to go out there surfing, which got me in trouble a few times. And then I found her and I just wanted to take a photo. I don't even know if she knows about this photo yet, but this is, this is Whitney. But I think also Whitney is so random. You have random experiences that you accumulate over the years that just pops up here and there. But there is also some consistency, and the consistency and take-home message is if you want to run the Whitney Laboratory as a director, you also have to get your hands dirty. And, and that's, that's the take-home message. And also Whitney gave me my wife over the years, and we got married and moved to Wales, Aberystwyth. So for those who don't know where Aberystwyth is, just I try to highlight here. So this is basically the west coast of Wales. Uh, Cardiff is the capital, and then Swansea, big city. And usually the south is known for the industry and the, where everything is going on. And here at the Aberystwyth, we are basically in the mid-Wales area, and it's pretty rural. So we are a university town with nine, ten thousand people. Uh, and with the students that doubles or triples, and in the whole region we are talking about like 80,000 people. So when I talk about uh, Aberystwyth, uh, oh, oh, oh. let's get out of this. So when I talk about Aberystwyth, a couple of things come to mind, and one of them is the great, great scenery, it's hills, it's also the, um, very close to the birthplace of Charles Darwin, big mountains and stunning beauty, but also, a lot of sheep. <laughs> and we, we tend to measure distances, travel distances by sheep, because you cannot travel five miles without seeing a sheep in, in Welsh hills. But of course, those, those are just artificially made photos. The reality looks like this. You know, it's, it's very rough. It can get really rough. And this is literally on the coast. Uh, the, these hotels, these are all hotels. And usually, it flooded most of the time. Not most of the time, once in a while. You see a lot of pebbles around here. And as, as foreign good citizens, we try to do our job and do a little bit of outreach. And this is my wife in British Science Week, trying to teach um, secondary school students. She's in biochemistry, so these are some chemical experiments. And this is her first, as an American, this is United, from the United States, this is her first experience to be a foreigner in a different country. And even though she's a native English speaker, one of the kids one day just came to her and said, you talk funny. <laughs> and of course, Welsh, uh, known for their language way, you know, Welsh, and their accent is so, so beautiful. But it was interesting for Alison to experience it, actually, and she does three different uh, experiments, and at the end, I think she didn't let the kid do the last experiment because of the alteration that they had. But also, we tried to bring some of the, I don't know if you can read this, uh, try to bring some of our American culture to Wales, and basically this is our third Thanksgiving dinner invitation letter, which she wrote it as a manuscript. So it starts with, ask not for whom the turkey gobbles, it gobbles for thee. And the authors are Alison Zwaric and Otara Kanyeti. And just in the acknowledgement, I'm not just going to read it, but it's basically, uh, we have the introduction methods, and in the acknowledgements, we would like to thank Rob, Rotary Butchers for providing a sufficiently sized turkey for this event. The first author would like to thank the second author for the generous funding given to this project. <laughs> so, you know, as a, <laughs> as a young academic, actually, even if you know that it's not real, when you, get, when you send the manuscript out and if you start getting uh, replies, and the first reply just says, article accepted for publication, no revisions are required, it feels good. <laughs> it really feels good. But of course, the, you know, scientists know this very well. The life is, not, is never perfect, and you start getting 
uh, also some minor or major corrections. And of course, there are also some hidden agendas. Like here, for example, this is Ms. Watch and Dr. Akanyi's team. Much as I respect the integrity of your learned journal, I feel that your thesis requires empirical testing, so I will be delighted to attend the conference. And of course, the editor. Oh, we are just a little bit on the on the bottom, and basically, please revise the manuscript in the light of reverse comments, hungry editor. So you also have to read between the lines because those messages are important if, you're, if you want your manuscript to be accepted. So the dinner happened, uh, everything went well. So these are the people in our house. There are lots of photos from Whitney in this wall. Whitney still lives with us. But what I want to do today, uh, if you if you like to contribute to me, uh, I would like to ask you a few questions, and I want you to highlight a few of these uh, characters in this photo, if it's okay. And the first character that I would like to ask you is, can you identify me in this photo? Is it easy? Okay. Can you identify a pregnant woman in this photo? How do you identify her? So she has a little bit of a belly. Any other, any other signs? Oh, yeah, and her hand is on the stomach, right? So these are the features that we are using when we are trying to classify people or recognize things. That's interesting. What about who is the tallest person in this photo? This one? How many people think this is the tallest people in this photo? Oh yeah, he's, he's standing on, on a footstool. <laughs> what about this guy? He's actually an um, army reserve. He's my student, he's, he's working on robotics. But maybe this guy, because he's just bending his head a little bit? It might be, right? So the, to answer this question, we are a little bit more uh, in dilemma. What about... If I ask, if I tell you that there's one person from Latin America, can you tell me who she is? This one? This one? This one? She's from India. <laughs> she is, she's from Brazil. Okay, last question. There's one person in this photo who doesn't look happy. <laughs> this guy? Okay. Now the most difficult question. Why do you think he's not happy? Okay, one option. He doesn't eat turkey. Who thinks that he doesn't eat turkey is the answer. Okay, couple. What else? Sorry? That's not... Yeah, he simply doesn't smile. Yeah, that... Ah, because you talked about the title, and that's why you're just... No, no stroke. He's old enough that everything hurts. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he had, a, he had a fight with his wife. Michelle, no. Sleeping? No. Actually, uh, he, he has a condition. He has a Parkinson's disease. Yeah. So this brings me to my next slide. And actually, one of the questions that you think, uh, as, a, as a fish person or a robotics person, how come you all of a sudden uh, start getting interested in human? But then the more I think about it, I think, I, I find that I'm attracted to it so easily. It's, human is so powerful. Whatever you do in life, I think it gravitates um, scientists and intellectual ideas towards them because we are really in a challenging environment. And what this graph shows, or what this table shows here is, this is the life expectancy in the UK and in the United States in 1960 and 2020. So this is good. So what we see here is that roughly in 70 or oh, 60 years' time, we increase the life expectancy by 10 years. But the, the challenge with this comes 
is the fact that, you know, when we get older, we are also dealing with more chronic conditions. So probably most of these conditions are not um, foreign to you. You more or less know what they are. And what's really challenging, especially in the rural communities, is usually people who have these conditions typically are more isolated because places and houses are more apart from each other. Usually you tend to think about farming communities. They usually have lower income. Access to hospitals is a problem. Usually in well-developed places, if you can access the hospitals in maybe 10, 15 minutes time, but here it can take up to half an hour, 45 minutes, and that, especially in urgent situations, is a huge, huge problem. And also, people don't want to live in these rural communities. It's very difficult to get young professionals into rural communities. And also, the young people are living out of these communities. So it's not that just we are experiencing these conditions, but we are also have to deal with them in, in much more challenging situations. And what's really, really remarkable, and when I uh, find about these statistics, it was an eye-opening experience for me, is in the UK, not just in rural areas, unaccounted caring costs. So what this means is if someone in your family member has some kind of chronic condition, obviously you fall into that caring duty, and nobody pays anything for you to do this. And if NHS, National Health Service in the UK, which is an, uh, probably it would be NIH in the States, uh, wants to take that into account in their budget, they have to pay additional 120 billion per year. And if you look at their budget, it's already 150 billion. So they have to double their budget in order to account for those costs. And this is a huge, huge problem that our society is facing today. And not just in UK, in the US, or anywhere else in the world. And why this is a problem? Because if you are taking care of someone, you are not just providing a physical uh, work, but you are also dealing with a lot of psychological patterns as well. And what statistics shows, if you are a carer, you are more likely going to be in the health risk in the following five years than any person who doesn't have to take care of someone else. So it's a vicious cycle that can trigger one after another and then just goes and on and on and then become a big issue. So obviously today what I'm going to talk about is one of these conditions, which is stroke. And you can have stroke in two different ways. The first one is either you have a blood clot in the, one of the main arteries or any arteries in the brain, and because those arteries are the oxygen and blood supply to the brain regions, when you cut that, you start having a cell death in the brain. An alternative way, you can have a burst, and burst also starts bleeding in the brain, and it has a maybe not exactly similar, it exactly equal, but similar effect, and you again have a cell death. So you have a damaged brain area that can cause by two different things. And these two different uh, conditions are important because when you go to hospital within the first 24 hours when you are being treated, the treatment of these two conditions are very, very different. And if you are diagnosed in the wrong way, so if you are having ischemic stroke and if you are diagnosed with this and treated with this, it can even cause your um, death. So what happens is you go to the hospital and hopefully you know, the effects can, can vary depending on uh, what kind of stroke and severity you are having. But the conditions can be really uh, impactful, so you can have gait impairments or motor impairments in the hands and the limbs. It can be cognitive, so you can lose your speech and you cannot even uh, parse information. Or it can be sense, so you may not sense pressure, temperature, or any related issues. Or it can also have a huge burden in psychologically, because it, a lot of people actually now started narrating stroke about patients themselves, and they, they describe it as you, you die and you are born as a new person, which you are not able to do the things that you are able to do, and you are not even able to think the way you are able to do it now. So it's a, it's a huge transformation that comes all of a sudden. And of course, uh, from health service providers' perspective, the outcomes that uh, we are interested in, we are trying to basically hone this into numbers, we are talking about disability scores, 
you know, what is the mortality or death rate after stroke, in how many years can you live, uh, and can these people return back to employment so that they help society or not. So if you look at the timeline of the process, so when someone has a stroke, the first 24 to 72 hours is extremely important because you typically, the, the main intervention is done here. And if, if, it's, if, you are, if you are caught early, then it can be treated and you can actually uh, get out of the hospital, walk out of the hospital in a very good condition. But if that doesn't happen, uh, patients are transferred into acute or subacute units, uh, and it changes depending on their severity from one week to six months. And they are usually, in this period, they go through uh, a lot of therapy, and depending on what kind of symptoms they're expressing. So it can be speech therapy, it can be physiotherapy, it can be occupational therapy, it can be psychological therapy. And then once they come to a stable condition, and this is very, very important, this doesn't mean that they recover, but they are stable condition, and which, what that means is their condition is not expected to get any worse or any better. They are released from the hospital. And now you're in the chronic, chronic domain, and then you have to take care of your life for the rest of your time. And if you look at the, again, I'm talking from the NHS perspective, if you look at the numbers, so a stroke patient costs almost like 50,000 pounds a year uh, to NHS, and only 30% of this is paid by NHS itself. Actually, this is the, to the cost of the whole economy. And as you can see, the biggest portion comes from the informal care, which is provided by family members. And over the years, basically, this cost uh, drops. But again, here, NHS doesn't do much, and the rest is covered by invisible heroes. But what this graph doesn't, or this statistic doesn't show you, is what happens here, usually in this, if you are especially living in a sedentary lifestyle, you're going to cause some, you're going to develop some secondary health issues that is going to trigger more problems, and you're going to get back into the system, and you're going to get treatment as well. So you're even costing more and more money to the system. And hopefully, the ideal scenario is, and now in the UK and in the US, what we are trying to do, um, or what's the motto is basically, can we identify those people that who are at high risk of having stroke? And there are some indicators, and these are uh, high blood pressure, cholesterol, atrial fibrillation means you have basically abnormal heartbeat. Uh, it can go really fast, and then basically those, because it is related with the blood, uh, cardiovascular issues is usually a triggering factor. And then, if we can predict, the next step is actually, can we also change the lifestyle in order to prevent the disease? Because in this case, the best therapy is prevent. And if you want to prevent something, the regime, I'm sure you heard about this a lot, but there's no um, harm to repeat it. It's healthy diet, exercise, no smoking, and either no drinking or drinking moderation. And especially with the, uh, from the computer science perspective, when we get into more about uh, what are the opportunities that we can do once the stroke happens, we are really talking about the sooner we detect the symptoms and the sooner we understand what's going on and intervene, the outcomes are better. Another thing that actually computer science and wearable technologies can help is can we objectively assess uh, the severity of the symptoms and how we can help these patients. And then another interesting domain that people start looking into is once you start characterizing a patient's profile depending on the symptoms and the brain regions that it, um, it's damaged, can we use AI to predict the likeliness of recovery so that we can allocate resources efficiently and to the right people? And this is a huge uh, area that you're going to start hearing more and more in the upcoming years. And even with the uh, human genome and human connectome, so we are now into coming into a completely different uh, area, which is basically we are talking about personalized medicine. So there is no um, peeled feed for all, but we are really looking forward to opportunities that can actually target people individually, depending on their genetic and molecular makeup, and find customized solutions that can impact those people the best. But what's really, 
where we want to basically put our stamp on, at least as a, as to begin with, is this area where, as you can see, it's completely blank. And what this area shows us here is, again, in this domain where we are talking about chronic patients, once they're released from the hospital, which are assumed that actually there's can not, not much can be done for them, can we intervene here and actually change their life? So this is a study that we are about to start from NHS. It's called Automatic Assessment of Gait Impairment and Monitoring Recovery in Stroke Patients. And here, actually, there are uh, basically this is in collaboration with Dr. Federico Villacra from Aberystwyth University. He's in the exercise physiologist and neuroscientist. And there are four key term uh, keywords in this study. One is chronic patients, like I was telling you before. Second is exercise therapy. Three is wearable sensors to quantify the outcomes of this exercise therapy. And machine learning in order to do data analysis and predict stroke outcomes for the future generations. So we, when we start with chronic patients, like I said, uh, they are in a stable condition and they have low probability of recovery, but if we can show that actually exercise can really impact these patients, it's going to be very revolutionary and it's, it's going to ask the policymakers to rethink about how to uh, standardize the healthcare in order to start basically providing services for those people. And like I said, they are neglected, but also because of this vicious cycle, they're more uh, under risk for further conditions. And why exercise is important? So what this graph is showing is a study done uh, on Harvard alumni. Here I have the reference, but for some reason uh, I cannot show it here. But this study is very interesting. So basically, in years between 1962 and 1988, uh, authors followed almost like 17,000 men aged between 35 to 74, and look at their lifestyle and see how many of those people lived for how long. And what you see on the x-axis is a physical activity index, which basically shows how active they are in terms of exercise. So just to give you an example, you can burn 500 calorie kilocal if you do a high-intensive half-an-hour exercise. So what they are showing here is, uh, this is weekly, so they say that if you are basically not exercising at all, and this also includes your daily activities, like if you are basically walking in the house or you're going to the supermarket, this one means that you know, this is basically the control group, sedentary lifestyle, no exercise at all. This is the, uh, basically whatever the number is, the death rate. And whenever you see a number below then, that means that uh, exercise is helping you and you're less likely you're gonna die in the following years. So what you see, if you do exercise within the range of 3,000 to 3,500 kilocal per week, you basically reduce the risk of dying by 50%. So if you don't remember anything else from this talk, please remember this. And this is not just for uh, any man. They also look at different conditions. So you can have hypertension, you can have COPD, diabetes, smoking, obesity, or high uh, total cholesterol. And again, one is our standard. What they show here is, and here is basically physical activity index is shown in a slightly different uh, metric. So basically five MAT or less is low intensity and eight and higher is basically high intensity. So if you are doing high intensity exercise, whatever condition you have, you come back to normal. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter. As long as you exercise, you can keep those conditions under, under the normal condition. But if you don't, the numbers look horrifying. So a colleague of mine, when he was describing these numbers to me once, he said, if I tell people that they can take this pill that actually comes with all these different reg remedies in it that actually can regulate everything, people would love to take that pill and help their life. But if I tell them to do exercise, it's not that easy. But basically, exercise does that for you. So coming back, by how does this relate to um, stroke? First of all, if we can help stroke patients exercise, obviously they're going to increase their uh, physiology, their fitness, so they're going to have lots of benefits. But also, this is a very interesting uh, concept, neuroplasticity. Exercise has been shown that can help to 
recover some of the brain function through synoptogenesis. So brain has the power to rewire itself in order to gain some of the functions that has lost due to the stroke. And what you see here is this is the lesion site, so where, where the damage has ha happened. And let's say this is in the primary motor cortex, uh, we are looking at an area which basically the light gray is controlling the elbow and shoulder or wide range. This is the hand area that controls hand movements. And some of the maybe hand movements or some of the regions in the brain region that controls hand movements are damaged. If you don't exercise, even the other areas are going to start shrinking. And why this is happening? Because if you are not using your left hand, and if you keep it because it has some kind of a little bit of a defect, then brain stop allocating some of the resources for this hand anymore, and then that area starts shrinking. You start losing a muscle tone as well, and then all of a sudden uh, things start getting worse. On the other hand, if you are basically exercising, you can it has been shown that you can actually start expanding that region, and then because you have a higher demand, I want to use my hand, and you are constantly sending signal to the brain saying, I would like to use my hand, can you help me? And then the brain says, okay, let me just do some, some favors to you. And this is Federico's study when he was in John Hopkins. So what, he, what they showed in this study, basically, is uh, they took chronic stroke patients uh, and they exercise them on a treadmill. So they have a harness, and they help the stroke patients to be on the treadmill, and three times a week, they were going for 40 minutes exercise. And what they measured, uh, in, a, in addition, they also have a control group. So basically, they split the uh, subjects into two groups. One of them received the six-month treadmill exercise, and the other group received standard stretching movements, like a physiotherapy. And at the end of the study, they look at the walking speed, aerobic fitness, and functional MRI. What functional MRI does, it looks at uh, which brain regions in the brain lights up, and that shows actually, in, you know, actually where you are able to control the movements that you are exhibiting. And what they show, that actually in treadmill walking speed, there's a 51% increase for those that actually have been exercising three times a week. And then also in the cardiovascular fitness increased by 20%. And those areas that are responsible in gait has a huge increase, uh, functional increase in, in, in patients that actually has been exercising using treadmill. So why velocity? Do you have a... And I was really interested about this, and I started looking around. Okay, why they always measure walking velocity? And it turns out that walking velocity is a predictor, of, or at least it's correlated with a lot of conditions, including mortality. So it's, there are studies out there showing that if you're walking below a certain threshold, you are more likely to die, probably because of other reasons. You know, because your walking speed is low because for a reason. And it's not necessarily the walking speed is killing you, but there's a numbers-wise, there's a correlation going on there. And you are less likely going to return to employment, the quality of life is less, and you are probably dependent on other people. But our argument, or when we start looking into this, we start saying, when we are measuring gait, walking velocity is a very good and very interesting uh, parameter to look at, but gait has much more to offer. And how we can harness some of those uh, additional parameters that can inform clinicians to, to make better decisions in clinical settings. And that's the big question. And when I say that it has much more offer, because when you are walking, you are not just interested in the speed, but your joints are moving, you are looking around, you are processing information, you know if I'm approaching this plant, I know that I'm getting closer. How do I take into account when I, when I should turn? How I'm coordinating my limb movements, my leg movements, what is my step length? how wide my legs are moving. I'm walking like this or I'm more normal. All these parameters, if we can delve into them, we can learn much more about what stroke is doing to people, to their gait, and how those uh, impairments are influencing their life. In the typical study to do much more detailed gait analysis, what you do is you have a series of cameras distributed around the subject. Subject is walking. And what you do is you put reflective markers on them 
in order to uh, capture the movement of those joint points. But obviously, this is a 150,000 uh, pound expensive tool. It's in the laboratory setting. And then you cannot just take it into the outdoor environments. And you cannot ask everybody to go into the, into the laboratories in order to get these measurements. So our argument is, can we use wearable technology in order to measure gait? And if we can use it, how much information we can extract from this technology? And what we decided to do with my student Einer and Dan, we said, we have two options. Either we're going to build our own sensors and put them on the body, or we're going to use existing off-the-shelf technology. So the advantage of the first option, if you start building your own sensors, you know exactly what goes into it. You can design it however you like, and you can put as many as you want on the body. The disadvantage is, first of all, it might be more expensive. Second is, when you are asking people to wear additional sensors on them, it impacts their life. You want this technology to be as seamless as possible, so it doesn't shout all the time that I have a condition, I have a condition, I have a condition. Because at the end of the day, the target is, can we help those patients to live a normal life that they can continue without even feeling that they have carrying a technology on them? And with today's technology, this is uh, possible, especially today's smartwatches and mobile phones comes with more motion sensors. So what my students did, actually, they wrote a middleware, which basically they hijacked the sensors in the commercial products and start recording from the sensors of those products. And what they do is, phone communicates with the watch, ask the watch, can you start please recording the data? Watch starts recording, phone also is recording, because your phone is also have those motion sensors. So we are getting two measurements, one from the phone, one from the watch. And the nice thing about this, watch can be on your wrist, and phone can be on your uh, waist, so that one, you can get a center of gravity along the body, and you can get also the arm swing. So you have two spatial positions, and you can synchronously record from these two positions. And once the recording is done, watch tells the phone, OK, I had enough. Then phone tells the watch, OK, send me all your data. Watch sends the data. Phone packages the data and send it to the online server. And then we display it on the screen here, which is basically you can access it with any computer, tablet, or whatever you want. And the next step of this is basically an AI algorithm is going to sit on the server or the cloud and analyze the data and tells you basically what the gate parameters are. So the goals of the project is, can we differentiate gait patterns of stroke patients from those of age much individuals? So can we tell like when someone is walking, what is a healthy walk look like versus what is a stroke walk look like? Can we characterize the gait impairment? So one person can walk like this, another person can walk like this, another person can walk like this. All are this possible. But can we differentiate those? Because of depending on what type of walk are you exhibiting, your treatment might change. And more importantly, if we can do this, can we then put it on a time scale and look at the effect of any type of intervention like treadmill exercise therapy? Because at the end of the day, we objectively would like to address and identify actually whether these type of therapies are helping or not, because we cannot waste the resources of NHS or any other healthcare provider just for the sake of fantasy. And just to give you a little bit of an idea about what's being currently employed in the clinical practices. So when you, uh, not just for gait, but if you talk about gait, when you go to a clinician and they look at you and they want to examine you, usually what they have is that they have a score sheet, which goes from zero to six, depending on the scale that they are using. And what this means, if you are zero, you are basically categorized as healthy. And if you are six, that means that you have a very severe 
and probably a paralyzed uh, situation where you cannot even walk properly. So six numbers quantify what your gait, actually num one number between zero and six quantifies you know, what type of gait you have and the severity. And what happens is usually uh, there's a white coat syndrome where actually as soon as you get into the hospital you can start exhibiting slightly different anomalies. It's not a natural condition and it has been measured only once because you cannot go to hospital every day. So we are basically evaluating people only with one measurement, which is done in a very unnatural condition, and it's very qualitative. So if you are a, if you are a physician from Cyprus, and you are dealing with certain type of PT, coming from a certain culture, and if you had a fight with your wife, you might give a five, and if you are giving, coming from a very experienced um, a neurologist and look at the same patient, you might give a different score. So these inappropriate clinical variations uh, can be minimized by using a little bit more objective and quantitative methods. This doesn't mean that the current clinical practice is not working. It is working. I think the best judgment in the world is human. And I think we should keep relying on human judgment. So this, is, this talk is not about um, getting rid of human decision-making and automating everything, because I don't believe in that. I think what I believe in is, can we help, can we bring technology into the picture to support clinicians to make better decisions, not to replace them? So we should have faith in our clinicians, but we should also help them to perform or practice their profession in the best possible way, not necessarily wasting their time for things that can be automated. So, this study is so new, and this was the risk when I was giving this talk, uh, when I decided to give this talk, because I don't have data from stroke patients to show you today, because basically the first patient is literally this week is coming into the lab and starting the experiments. But what I wanted to do today is I want to basically take a one step back and actually address, in my opinion, equally important question and show you how this technology can, can be in use. And the questions that we're going to address today, can we recognize daily activities of living? So can we differentiate walking from sitting, or sitting from standing, or walking from stairs up, or going down the stairs? Having one watch and one phone, is it enough to tell the difference between if someone is going upstairs or coming downstairs? That's the question. Because as computer scientists, or like at the beginning of our uh, Basically, beginning of the presentation, when I was asking you who is the tallest person in this place, or is there one person from Latin America, and when you were trying to find that person, some questions was easier than the others. Why? Because the information was there for certain questions. But for other questions, the information is not there. If I ask you, okay, who was the happiest person in that photo, you would never be able to tell me who that person is. I wouldn't even know the answer because we don't have that information in that photo. In one snapshot of an image, doesn't contain that information. So that's why, as computer scientists, we are interested. Okay, we are developing this system, but what is the maximum limitations of this system? How much information we can extract from it? What information is even available to us to process? Because if we can figure that out, then we know that, okay, at least the information is there, and then the question becomes how we can harness it. But if the information is not there, whatever you do, whatever hoops you jump, you are not going to be able to extract anything because you are basically the ba very basic principle. Garbage in, garbage out. So can we recognize daily activities? And then this turn into even a more interesting question. Maybe we can end on this. Because what we are seeing that, uh, or let me, okay, I will hold on to this, so I'm not going to talk much about this. And then how much information is available. And to do this, what we are basically doing is we have our variable data as an input. Like you are identifying a pregnant woman, we extract features from this variable data. That can be uh, somebody is putting the hand on the belly, or a belly is a little bit bigger than the others. But in time series or Signal-wise, we also have methods to extract those features from time points. And then once we do that, we need some kind of a human brain to do that classification. But in computers, we can also 
approximate this in a very simplistic terms. And once we do have these two components, then we produce an output that tells us what that class is, whether someone is walking versus sitting. So what we did is basically we asked 17 different subjects to perform these six tasks. So walking, jogging, sitting, standing, stairs up and stairs down. And we record one minute data for each activity. And in total, we have 102 minutes worth of data. And this is how the data looks. So basically, this is uh, a person. Actually, this is my data. So basically, blue is jogging, and purple or magenta is walking. And what you see here is a forward acceleration. So this is coming from the phone. So what forward acceleration means is when you're walking, your speed is not constant. Or even though your walking speed is constant, every time you head a step, you just accelerate and decelerate a little bit. And this basically, this forward acceleration measures that. So by looking at every peak, you can count the number of steps. And probably this is what your Fitbit is doing. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and this is an arm swing velocity coming from the watch. So basically, this shows how fast you are swinging your arm. And this is an interesting uh, measurement because, for example, in Parkinson's disease patients, one of the symptoms is uh, rigidity. And usually, when they walk, you don't see hand movements at all. And it has been shown that even they are, before they are diagnosed with Parkinson's, it's an interesting early indicator of that something might be wrong. Yet, a lot of people also walk without swinging their arms. So it doesn't mean that, you know, like, whoever is not swinging their arms, they have to have a, or they're going to develop a Parkinson's disease. So, and that's the difficulty and challenging part with the human work, because you can see a huge spectrum of variation in different scenarios. Obviously, uh, what you see here is the same thing, but now the difference is we are comparing walking with sitting. So when you sit, you don't see much activity, expectedly, because you're just sitting. And it's much easier to differentiate walking from sitting. As you can see, the signals look very, very different than walking from jogging. I am not showing here, the, if I showed you also sitting versus standing, because both of them are static, you are not moving. Theoretically, we shouldn't be able to differentiate the two. But is that true? So, feature extraction. So, we are not at the point of detecting bellies and putting hands, and uh, this is basically a simple signal that goes up and down. And you, but even though something like this, which is called a time series, which changes in time, different data points, you can still extract a lot of interesting features from this. And the simplest feature is basically you take the average of this one second worth of data. That's one number, one feature. You can also look at this standard deviation from the mean, so how much the data points vary from this mean value, and that's called standard deviation. That can be your second feature, another number. You can also look at the maximum value in this signal, or minimum value, and this would be your four features that you use in order to enter into your classifier. But these four features that I show you here are very, very basic. And computer scientists have found ways actually to extract much more features, many more interesting, more sophisticated features. For example, you can detect these peaks. You can look at the time difference between the secondary peak versus the first peak. You can look at the slope of this curve. You can look at how, far, you know, how slowly the minimum point is changing. What's the time difference between maximum and minimum point? And the list can go on and on and on. But the goal of here is not just to basically uh, vomit all this information to you, but just overall just help you to understand the basic principles behind this technique. And of course, once you have the uh, features, and let's call them feature one and feature two, the question then becomes, can we devote a classifier that actually can separate these two different classes? This is a simplified, cartoonish version of the problem that I was just presenting to you earlier. In six different daily activities, we have six different behaviors. Here we are just talking about two different classes, which basically they are, can be behaviors. And this is how the, uh, those classes look like. But if you want to develop an algorithm that actually can separate the uh, purple from the blue, 
how would that algorithm look like? So one thing we can do is we can actually divide this into, because here it's visually it's easy, we can divide this into uh, one line, like a threshold Y1, which basically controls the feature 2. So we can say whenever feature 2 is higher than Y1 value, then we are in this area. And whenever it's lower, we are in this area. We can also do it in for feature 1, for X1 and X2 values, they're like their thresholds. So this allows us to access this corner, middle section and this section. And then by having some if then else statements, we can easily parse this information and identify those classes. And I'll just show you an example. This is how the computer may work. So you get the feature 2. You check if feature 2 is lower than y1. If it's lower than y1, you are looking at this area. Then you look at feature 1. And if feature 1 is lower than x1, then you are basically looking at this area. And then we automatically detect class 2. If feature 1 is higher than x1, so you are basically looking at either this guy or this guy, and you do another branch out, and then you can identify those classes. So I did this on pen and paper for this simple problem to come up with this tree, and this is called the decision tree. But there are also computing methods that can automatically calculate this for us as long as we provide the data to the, to the program. So we train the machine learning and AI in order to identify these rules. And once we have these rules, they help us to predict what behavior is going on in the activities we recorded. So this is the result. So what you see here is this is the walk, jog, sit, stands, stairs up and stairs down predicted by the AI. And these are the actual behaviors that I keep record of. So what you expect to see if AI was perfect, every time AI said this is walk, it turns out to be walk, and you get the highest hit here, and you get the diagonal very high numbers, and all of the rest would be zero. And then you would know that your algorithm is perfectly classifying the behaviors, and you can detect whenever, whenever you, uh, variable data you provide in, it tells you which activity is currently being executed. But it's not perfect even though it's very good accuracy, so we are talking about 95, 96, 97% accuracy in detecting the right activity, there are still some instances. For example, uh, walk is typically confused by stairs up and stairs down, which is normal because when you're climbing the stairs, you're also walking, or when you're climbing down. So there's some kind of confusion going on there. Similarly, when you are sitting and standing, at the beginning we thought that it's going to be nightmare and impossible to detect the two because in, you are not moving. But it turns out that when people are standing, they cannot freeze. They are just moving slightly. We oscillate. And apparently those oscillations provide a, a great deal of information. And from that information, you can extract whether someone is standing versus sitting versus lying. And then next step, we start thinking about, OK, I have a watch. Watch has two sensors in it. One is an accelerometer, which basically measures how fast things change in the Cartesian axis, vertical axis. But it also has a gyroscope, which basically measures the rotational velocity. So they have two sensors. Then we said, do we need both sensors? Like, how many, you know, even though we have watch and phone, do we need both of them in order to make this classification? So what we start doing, we start shutting down the sensors one by one to see which ones are important and which ones are not. And what here, what I'm showing you is, if I'm using all the sensors from all the, to both devices, I can reach to 95 or 97% accuracy. If I'm just using sensors from the phone, I'm reaching 95.4, so slightly worse. If I'm using the accelerometer only and nothing else from phone, I can still get 95% accuracy. If I go to gyroscope, 90. Similarly, if I go to watch gyroscope, if I'm just using this sensor, my accuracy drops to 78%. But what this means is, if you have a single data point coming from one part of your body, either from your arm or from your back, 
you can still tell what a person is doing, whether walking, standing, jogging, going up or down the stairs. So when we were, when we were doing this work, um, Luke and I started, you know, we really got excited and we said, okay, so we can de detect um, activities, but we also have 17 subjects. Let's make this problem much harder. Why don't we use the activities in order to try to predict who is performing those activities? So now what we want to do is, can we recognize people from the activities that they are doing? And we know that this is possible because if you see someone walking with your eye, you can easily tell who this person is. But obviously with image processing, with eyes, we are dealing with a much higher dimension of information. So it's much, much bigger. It's much easier, more rich information. With wearable sensors, we are looking at two spatial points. And it turns out that, scary, this graph looks much more crowded table because there are 17 subjects, but still you see that the largest numbers are in the diagonal, which basically tells that you can still do this prediction very accurately. And if you look at the total accuracy, we are getting about 90%. 90, 90%. So with 90% accuracy, when someone gives you the wearable data, you can tell who that person is. So can you imagine the consequences of this type of application in surveillance and some other different types of fields? No comment. <laughs> so uh, obviously the goal is to bring this research back to stroke. And what you see here is actually a very interesting anecdote. So uh, Ken is a, uh, had a stroke two years ago. He is 62 years old. He is living in a nursing home in five miles down the university that we, we work at. So we go there. We went there for the first time to do recordings to get preliminary data. So our system works this way. Like I told you before, phone communicates with the watch. They collect the data. Watch sends the data back to the phone. Phone packages the data and sends it to the internet. We are living in rural ways. In this nursing home, there's no internet connection. We were collecting the data. Phone is trying to transmit the data to the internet. No internet connection. Data is lost. So we lost like two hours of data in one day. And it was a very good lesson for us as technology providers because what we didn't take into account is the geographical conditions that we live in. I gave you the lesson at the beginning. Rurality is like that. The challenges are like this. And ta 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 ta. But I went there as a scientist and I didn't take that rurality into account in my system. And then I had to live with the consequences. So, what we do now is basically our system collects the data, tries to send it to the server. If it cannot send it, it just saves it locally until it, reach, it reaches to an internet point and connects to internet again, and then sends it again. So now the data is not lost. So it was a big learning lesson for us. David is our exercise physiologist. So basically, he is the person uh, who trains. He will be training the patients. Even though we're going to do standardized training with treadmill exercise, in this case, Ken cannot benefit from it, because Ken has a full paralysis. So he had a left um, hemiparagic stroke, so his right side is completely paralyzed. But still. What was remarkable, with personal trainer, uh, at the beginning he wasn't able to stand up or walk at all, but now he is able to do it. His biggest issue is he's a little bit overweight, and he likes to drink beers one or two per night. And his, uh, David is trying to basically, hey, Ken, don't drink that much. I mean, then if you lose a few more, it's going to be much easier. Then you're going to walk more. And this is, this is interesting. And... Uh, crazy because that's the pleasure that, you know, you cannot just invest for the future all the time. You also want to have a daily uh, intake of whatever makes you happy, but there is a, is a balance. But what I like about this photo is a nurse, neuroscientist, exercise physiologist, uh, computer scientist, and a patient. So this basically summarizes the uh, complexity of the problem and the integrative approaches that has to be employed to be to be relevant in this field. So 
Aberystwyth is a small university, and then once you start making yourself a name about it, uh, one topic, then they also start pulling you to other things. And nowadays, uh, university is working on a strategic plan about health, and I have been asked to attend those meetings. Uh, and we are now trying to come up with a strategy, and this is the, my croquis that it's kind of, at least this is how I envision things. So if you are thinking about chronic disease management, whatever you want to put here, stroke, diabetes, cancer, up to you, I think there are like four uh, big pillars that has to come in play together. And obviously innovation is where uh, computer science, mechatronics, engineering can drive. And this, today's talk was all about this, but also there's a lot to discover from molecular behavioral and cognitive mechanisms, neural, like MRI studies. And so this is a very interesting domain as well. And you need an expertise also to better understand the underlying mechanisms that lead to those uh, consequences. Because innovations can help you to treat, to assist, to measure, but at the end of the day, the goal is to understand. Because the more you understand, the better you can innovate. But this doesn't mean much uh, if you cannot basically get this knowledge and know-how into the society. Because at the end of the day, I mean, this is not something that can stay in the lab. It has to go out. It has to go to the society. It has to be integrated with the current healthcare practices that has been delivered in your country. And also, we have a department, basically, exercise, and it's called WARU, Wellbeing and Health Science. And basically, their goal is going through health assessment, fitness training, uh, life coaching, even social, they have this new term now called social prescribing, which means nowadays mental issues are becoming huge. And, and the first carnage point is not easily accessible. So can we basically, when you feel depressed, can we, can we get you more integrated with the society so you, know, you can interact with other people and heal, not heal, but maybe get the help from your uh, community rather than trying to seek help from uh, clinical professional health providers. And this is my proud. Uh, I wasn't very productive in terms of uh, publications, but one thing that we did, uh, basically this is the Welsh Stroke Conference that has been going on for 18 years. And Aberystwyth University, for the first time, we represented it there. And we presented, and actually, uh, Azam got the best student award presentation for, with her MRI study on lesion segment detection, which, we ha which I haven't talked about today. But again, what you see here is uh, we, we were there with 11 people, uh, all our students. And if you look at the diversity of the group, like Jake is working on detecting AF, like abnormal heartbeat, uh, exercise physiologist, computer scientist, neuroscientist, uh, medical image analysis, uh, software developer, psychologist, exercise uh, uh, physiology student, mathematician from Germany, and computer science, computer scientist. I think this is uh, investment in, in human, in, like Jimmy at the beginning was saying about the next generation scientists, and I, I was privileged enough to be his uh, student, even though he just referred as a colleague, that was his humble opinion. And I want to just basically carry that light to the next generation. And I, that brings me to the end of my stroke part of the talk, and I think I want to stop here. And thank you very much, and welcome to your questions. <laughs>